on Tuesday, September 3rd, two days ago, Infowars.com put out an emergency news release because a high-level source at an Air Force base in West Texas, where the B-1B bombers are located, told us that secret mothballed nuclear weapons that weren't even supposed to be on the base were brought out of mothballs and loaded on trucks. And the police said, where are these going? Nobody's signing for it. The base commander simply gave orders, and everybody knew that this was completely irregular and that there had been a big controversy a few years before when this happened in Minot, North Dakota with cruise missiles. And so they were asking questions. And the truck drivers said, all we're told is this is going to South Carolina, and we don't know where it goes from there. Now, Anthony and I went on to speculate about this being used for a false flag, not just a strike in the Middle East or on Russia, and that missing warheads could be used to basically hold the East Coast hostage, or could be blamed on a foreign enemy, or could be used for a coup d'etat. And now, ladies and gentlemen, news tips came in today pointing out that Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina, that day gave speeches saying that South Carolina and their ports were targets of terrorists and that they would probably be hit by atomic or hydrogen bombs if we didn't immediately invade Syria. Incredible, ladies and gentlemen. This is how you take down a free country, is you have criminal elements within it that hold the nation hostage to terror, that build a police state grid in the name of fighting terror, and then hold that threat over the public if they don't give in to your demands. Just like they got caught staging a false flag with the chemical weapons in Syria, now they're desperate. And now we know that they're actively fear-mongering against the population on the East Coast. And on top of that, there's a giant FEMA drill that starts next week that runs for more than a month simulating terrorist attacks on the infrastructure and the power grid. They're going to have riot police out on the street. They're going to have checkpoints. They're going to have drills at nuclear power plants. All of this going on on the East Coast while this highly irregular disappearance of warheads has happened. And remember, back in 2007, we had missing cruise missiles flown out of the Dakotas down to Louisiana, and it was a national scandal. You do not have warheads that are not accounted for just accidentally being shipped places. This is unprecedented and is undoubtedly the most dangerous story we have ever covered. I do not like covering this. I do not like where this goes. My gut has never uh, been telling me that something uh, was was more dangerous than this. This is incredibly important because the entire world is waking up to the globalists that have hijacked America and the West and that are pushing us towards world war. Only 9% approve in a Reuters poll for strikes on Syria. The, the NRA is suing the NSA for spying on gun owners. It's all starting to come out and the tyrants are desperate. This could be their false flag to bring in full martial law. Or they could be threatening the rest of the Eastern establishment with nuclear blackmail if they don't go along with this. Regardless, this is big. Because our source has now gone dark. We're, we're unable to get a hold of them. Uh, this is extremely serious. We're going to go now to Anthony Gucciardi's breakdown of this report after we show you a clip from Tuesday where we speculated about what the missing nukes could be used for. Who knows what they're actually wanting to do with this nuclear weapon, this nuclear warhead. We could stop a potential false flag scenario inside the United States right now by exposing this. They I'm glad, very well said. I'm glad you raised that because we had the case now seven years ago, Minot, North Dakota, the missing cruise missiles mm -hmm. that weren't signed for, and a bunch of people on the base this then is got the, killed. It seems like the exact same thing because they denied it too. And we're going to play when we called the actual Air Force base. Sure, they denied the it. But they denied it back in 2007 as well when those nukes went missing. They said that they weren't missing, they weren't there, they didn't exist. And then they later admitted it. This seems the exact same thing. There was no signature. That's right. They later... They later said that it was a, just a mistake. Yeah. That, oh, we, we didn't sign properly. Then a bunch of people on the base committed suicide or died. So, again, the, the shadow government wants to be able to disappear some nukes that they can then maybe detonate, blame on Russia. 
Blame on American patriots. This could be a globalist coup to hold D.C. hostage. I mean, this is huge. It's going to South Carolina. Maybe the nukes are going to be deployed uh, into D.C. I mean, there's no telling with these globalists. Very important. We're going to cover it more on the radio tomorrow, 11 a.m. Central, Infowars.com. We can beat this, folks, if good people stand up. Alex Jones signing off. Just moments ago, I came across a bombshell mainstream media report that not only confirms what we told you two days ago about the secret nuke transfer that was off record, authorized by higher ups, potentially Obama, but literally scared me. I read the title of this. I read this report. I didn't want it to be true. I kept reading it. I read it probably 50 times before I was confident enough to talk about this. It scares me. It literally scares me. This is potentially one of the most important reports I've ever done in my entire life. Everyone needs to listen to this. Everyone needs to share this. Let me preface this. Yesterday, actually two days ago, we reported on, the same day this following report came out, this high-level source, which is 100% confirmed, has repeatedly been correct in the past, super high-level military source, telling us that Dias Air Force Base in Texas, in West Texas, is transferring was transferring on September 3rd nuclear warheads off record, no signature. The text says that Dias is beginning to move out nuclear warheads today. He got a tap and he said that it's the first time they've even acknowledged nuclear weapons since the 80s. And key point here, no signature was required for the transfer. It was all off record. This is a black ops movement of nuclear warheads. Now this is where it gets key. They were shipping them to South Carolina South Carolina, okay, this is what the high level military source told us, that they were shipping these nuclear warheads to South Carolina. Now, why is that important? This new article you'll see up on screen, screen from CBS, Lindsey Graham, Senator Lindsey Graham, has come out and said, nukes in the hands of terrorists could result in bomb coming to Charleston Harbor. Specifically, he's saying that if we don't attack Syria immediately, if we don't go in and have military action in Syria, we could have a nuke blow up South Carolina. It's amazing. Look at this. He says that if there is no U.S. response to Syria, Iran will not believe America's resolve to block Iran from developing nuclear weapons. He then says those nuclear weapons in the hands of terrorists could result in a bomb coming to Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, exactly where we told you they were moving the secret black ops off the record no transfer, nuclear warheads, the exact day this report came out, the exact day he said this. He's telling you, he's selling you, he's telling you that if we don't go to Syria, if we don't start bombing Syria, then these nuclear warheads, they're, they're going to have terrorists get these nuclear warheads and blow up Charleston, South Carolina. They're going to blame it on Iran and Syria as a motivation to go to war. Only 9% right now are willing to go to war, want to go to war. They can't have that. Lindsey Graham is willing to sacrifice South Carolina, or maybe he actually got intel from higher ups in the black ops offices that there's a nuke coming and you better watch out. And he's warning them because he says he's working to convince South Carolinians wary of the war that the situations in Syria and Iran are linked. Graham says Syria could destabilize the entire Middle East and again goes on to talking about how a nuclear weapon is likely to blow up Charleston, South Carolina. We're going to do a follow-up report on this. Everyone needs to get this out immediately. This plan is now exposed. This is bombshell, massive, breaking news. As we told you yesterday, high-level military source confirms nuclear warheads taken from Dias Air Force Base, transported to South Carolina. Now Lindsey Graham says, if we don't go to Syria, South Carolina is going to be nuked. A nuke is going to blow up in South Carolina. He's selling you right now. He's warning the citizens. Get this out everywhere. I'm Anthony Gucciardi of StoryLeak.com, working with the InfoWars Network. Get this out. In closing, I want to be clear about something. I totally agree with what Anthony just said. This is the biggest story we've ever covered. And we have these military and law enforcement sources that come to us because they know that we are unfiltered and that we will release key information and that we're not intimidated by the attack on whistleblowers in the press because I have sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth no matter what happens. But we do need your prayers and your support and we need you to get this article out to everybody you know because as Jim Garrison famously said, they said, why are you still alive? And they've killed hundreds of people in and around the Kennedy uh, assassination. And he said, because I stay in the spotlight. 
We need this info to stay on the spotlight. And we need to pray for the scales to fully come off the eyes, not just of the American people, but the people of the world. And in closing, I want to thank the military and law enforcement sources that are patriots and that understand what's happening, who are speaking out about the false flags in Syria and who are speaking out about potential mega false flags, nuclear false flags here in the United States. This is history happening right now. Get this report out to everyone you know. And Lord willing, we'll be back on the radio 11 a.m. Central tomorrow at InfoWars.com breaking this down. This is way above my pay grade. I'm in over my head big time. But so is everybody else. The establishment doing this is in over their head. They look scared, and they should be, because regardless of what happens to us and regardless of what you do with those nukes, the truth's now out there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you get the word out on this right now. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It's September 5th, 2013, and let's go straight into the news. Top story tonight, Russia says it's compiled a 100-page report blaming the Syrian rebels for a chemical weapons attack. In a statement posted on Russia's foreign ministry's website, Russia said the report had been delivered to the United Nations in July and includes detailed scientific analysis of samples that Russian technicians collected at the site of the alleged attack. Russia said that the investigation of the March 19th incident was conducted under strict protocols established by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. The statement also noted that the attention paid to the August 21st attack had diverted attention from the investigation into the March 19th incident, which was the reason why the U.N. investigators were there. There has been no immediate comment from the United States, and I doubt you're going to get it an immediate comment on this because they're too busy telling you that the Syrian rebels were not, a, were not responsible for, for this, even though they're showing you the footage of the Syrian rebels prepping the, the uh, device. I want to say, you know, you can't say for sure it was sarin gas or whatever they were using in that particular video, but you see the guys are turning the thing, turning the bomb, and they sh they're shooting off the rocket launcher, and, but they're saying, you know, that's, that's the Assad regime, even though these guys are not dressed in official uniforms. These guys have the Al-Qaeda logo on their videos, but that's not the uh, the Assyrian rebels, which I thought was very curious of the Obama administration to do that. They think you're really that stupid. And we'll be talking more about this. And it goes into this, going from chemical weapons with that. Let's say this, Russia warns of nuclear disaster if Syria is attacked. Russian foreign ministry spokesman has issued a statement warning that a military strike on Syria by the United States will result in a nuclear disaster. Oh, that's no big deal. A miniature reactor near Damascus and other nuclear facilities poses a threat of radioactive contamination if attacked. The consequences could be catastrophic, he said. Possible risks include possible contamination of adjacent territories with highly enriched uranium and radioactive decay products. And I'm sure the United States knows this, as you'll see in our next article. They've been scoping out Syria for some time, even though, you know, they're willing to launch the weapons and hit something that's of significance. It's my understanding. I've never been to Syria, but I'm pretty sure it's much smaller, considerably smaller than the United States of America. So if you launch your weapons over there willy-nilly, there's a good chance you're going to hit something that's rather important, something that could contaminate the area with radiation. But the United States American way is, you know, if you get a bunch of radiation poison, just Raise the levels of acceptable radiation. But, you know, that may not even come to that because, you know, Obama has specific language in his bills and his proposals that will allow him to send boots on the ground. Even though nobody wants to talk about that, we want to talk about that here at the InfoWars Nightly News. Pentagon knew in 2012 it would take 75,000 thousand ground troops to secure serious chemical weapons facilities. A U.S. Central Command arrived at the figure of 75,000 ground troops as part of a written series of military options for dealing with Assad's more than 18 months ago, long before the U.S. confirmed initially that the Syrian dictator was using weapons against rebel factions within his borders. And I'm not saying that's confirmed that uh, Assad actually used those weapons, and I'm not here cheerleading for Assad. I'm not cheerleading for Russia or anybody else, you know, who's 
trying to stave off this attack. But the United States is using very flaky evidence to launch an attack on Syria. You know, they knew all about this stuff a long time ago. They had the 75,000 ground troops, and they also knew about the oil pipelines in the Middle East. In a shocking story that could change the course of the war if the mainstream media chooses to cover it, Syrian rebels have admitted to an AP journalist that they were responsible for last week's chemical weapons incident. They revealed that the casualties were the result of an accident caused by rebels mishandling chemical weapons provided to them by Saudi Arabia. One militant told the AP, We were very curious about these arms, and unfortunately, some of the fighters handled the weapons improperly and set off the explosions. Imagine if a member of the Syrian government had admitted to an AP reporter that Assad was behind the chemical weapons attack. It would be all over the news instantly. Yet instead, they are obsessing over a Facebook post by Assad's 11-year-old son, while this bombshell story is ignored. More than a dozen rebels interviewed reported that their salaries came from the Saudi government. Many believe that certain rebels received chemical weapons via the Saudi intelligence chief, Prince Bandar bin Sultan. Saudi Arabia's alleged role in providing the rebels with chemical weapons is no surprise given the revelations earlier this week that the Saudis threatened Russia with terror attacks at next year's Winter Olympics unless they abandoned support for the Syrian president. So why is Saudi Arabia so keen to destabilize Syria? Well, it could all come down to a war of pipelines. According to estimates, Syria's oil reserves are greater than all those of neighboring countries except Iraq, making Syria one of the largest producers of crude oil in the Middle East. In spite of the fact that it has now been confirmed by most media sources that the Syrian opposition is actually al-Qaeda, the Western powers are still pushing to arm the rebels in order that they can gain control of key territories along the pipeline. The U.S.-NATO strategy focuses on helping the rebels to seize oil fields to stop the supply of petroleum products and to break up Syria's role as the main crossroad for alternative energy. One of the reasons why NATO and the Gulf Cooperation Council are using al-Qaeda terrorists to break up the Shiite-led alliance of Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Hezbollah is because the construction of a so-called friendship pipeline will transport Iranian natural gas through Syria and from there to foreign markets, turning Iran into a global economic power, giving it enormous leverage over the EU's Middle East policy. This is, of course, unsettling news to the Saudis who dominate oil exportation in the European markets alongside Russia. But who is Russia allied with? That's right, Iran and Syria. Now, the key point here is that up until now, the proxy war with Syria has not yet led to a hot war with Russia. While the debate has been framed as to whether or not Assad used chemical weapons, the New World Order's true geopolitical objectives in targeting Syria have been ignored. By that time we were bombing in Afghanistan, I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. So when the Saudi intelligence chief meets with Russian President Putin to hint at a possible terrorist attack if Russia doesn't abandon support for Syria, it actually seems like a last-minute desperate power grab by the U.S., NATO, and GCC to maintain their reign of global economic dominance by shutting down those countries who refuse to submit to the New World Order. Reporting for the InfoWars Nightly News, I'm Leanne McAdoo. Report. China sends warship to coast of Syria. According to the Russian news outlet Telegraphist, the ship has not been sent to engage in any aggressive action, but is merely there to observe the actions of Russian and U.S. warships. However, the ship is equipped for combat and is armed with missiles. So basically, China is trying to play peace cop. They're <laughs> trying to play a peace cop between the United States and Russia. They're saying, you know, if you guys want to go out here and have a steering contest all day, that's fine. But don't start anything because we brought a little something, something along with us. And we'll talk more about this after the break with Dr. Jerome Corsi and also myself. We're going to have a sit-down roundtable to discuss all things Syria. Let's come back to some domestic news. NRA joins ACLU lawsuit, claims NSA starting gun registry. And the article goes on and says, 
The National Rifle Association joined the American Civil Liberties Union's lawsuit on Wednesday to end the government's massive phone records collection program. In its filing, the gun rights group claims the NSA's database would allow the government to identify and track gun owners based on whether they called gun stores, shooting ranges, or the NRA. The article also goes on to say that it violates the First Amendment and thinks that people would be intimidated by a force such as the NSA being able to track their every move and would actually hurt the NRA membership, as it would hurt many other things. You heard the Right after Edward Snowden broke the NSA information, a lot of people started going back to snail mail. And then it came out they were tracking your snail mail. They're taking photographs of the front and back of your snail mail. So they want to know everything that you're doing. So, you know, I've been critical of the NRA in the past, but I'm definitely happy to see that they're getting on board with this. They're saying this isn't a left issue. It's not a right issue. It's about a personal right issue, a human right issue not to be monitored 24-7 by Big Brother. So good job to you, NRA. And we'll end with this shot while waiting for the police. Now I want you to send this report out to everybody you know who's against guns, who says, you know, if, if something did happen, I'll just dial 911. Let's see what happened when this person dialed 911. Police Chief James Craig has suspended two 9-11 dispatchers for delays in sending officers to separate calls for service, including one that eventually resulted in a death. Fox 2's Charlie LeDuff says a woman who feared for her safety called 911 six times but the dispatcher waited more than an hour to send officers to the dispute. LaDuff says that by the time the officers arrived, the woman was shot by a man armed with an AK-47. She is now listed in critical condition, and the, the article goes on from there. So a lot of people will say, well, you know, this is why we don't need to have guns. This guy was walking around with an AK-47, and he shot this woman. I would say it didn't matter what type of firearm this guy had, because I'm guessing the woman didn't have an arm, or at least wasn't able to get to it. So while she's waiting for the police to arrive for X, Y, Z reason, even if the dispatcher did call the police promptly and say, hey, you need to arrive at this residence right away, you know, the cop could have got a flat tire, he could have gotten a traffic accident, could have been a snowstorm, a whole bunch of different reasons why the police couldn't get there in a timely fashion. And now this woman has been shot, you know, it says uh, two people were injured in these uh, incidents, at least one person is dead. This other person is in critical condition. So this is why you need to have a firearm and know how to use it. I'll keep my God, I'll keep my guns, and you can keep the change. That's not the quote of the day, but this is our quote of the day. If tyranny and opposition come to this land, it will be in the guise of fighting a foreign enemy. That by James Madison. Now stay tuned because like I said earlier, right after this break, myself, David Knight, and Jerome Corsi, Dr. Jerome Corsi, will be here discussing all things Syria. But first, if you like this broadcast and you'd like to see it continue, stop by PrisonPlanet.tv and pick up a 15-day free trial as the Alex Jones Show, the nightly news, the rants, the special reports, it's all right there on PrisonPlanet.tv. And also stop by the InfoWars shop and pick up our new magazine. I got one right here. It has the image of Obama. You know, and it's pretty self-explanatory, but if you go in, it's all about the political correctness and, you know, everybody worshiping Obama. You know, we've seen the kids, uh, the kid pray to Obama, and I'm not too mad at the kid. I'm more ups upset at the parent who did not correct the child's mistake. But anyway, uh, you know, the rodeo clown who got fired and now they have to take sensitivity training. It's all in this edition of the InfoWars magazine. So stay tuned right after this for the roundtable on Syria. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the Infowars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happens. So check it out, Infowars.com forward slash show. Many anthropologists and archaeologists believe that before man even discovered uh, the power to harness and use fire, we were involved in agrarian activities. That is, taking the seeds of plants and then replanting them to produce more. The very foundation of our modern civilization and human culture is centered around the planting and cultivation of edible plants. Here are some of the amazing deals at InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. The Survival Seed Vault by My Patriot Supply features only the finest survival heirloom seeds for a robust and hardy garden, even in the toughest times. We also have starter varieties of the deluxe seed packages for fruit, salad, salsa, peppers, medical herbs, and more. Go to the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsShop.com. And remember, 
the revolution against tyranny is growing. And welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. This is our Syrian opposition, uh, Syrian rebel panel, I guess you would say. We have a lot of news we want to talk about about these rebels, about the whole situation that's going in in Syria. Also, uh, I'm joined here by David Knight. Nice to see you, David. Thank you, Carl. And also Dr. Jerome Corsi, who is joining us via Skype. How are you, doctor? I'm doing great. Good to be with you. Thank you. Now, Doctor, during the break, you were telling us about some information that you were looking into on John McCain and the company he keeps in Syria. Well, you know, the first of all, the the shifting story is now that um, John Kerry has been accused of lying, saying that the uh, rebels were not Al Qaeda. Well, you know, we all know the rebels are at least a great number of the rebels in Syria are Al Qaeda, and so. Today, the effort's been by the administration to try to say, well, wait a minute, some of these rebels are good guys. Well, uh, I started going back to some of the pictures, for instance, remember when John McCain was in um, Syria? Uh, this was just recently. He was in Syria in August. And he shows up and he's pictured with all these um, you know, so-called Syrian freedom fighters around him. Well, one of the guys gets identified as... Uh, Muaz Mustafa. He was a smiling man on the right-hand side of the picture where, where McCain is. And this guy, Mustafa, has been in Libya. He's been all over the Middle East. He uh, identifies with the Palestinians. Uh, he's got all kinds of uh, posts on Twitter and Facebook that make it clear he's really a, um, I'd call him a freelance revolutionary, a freelance you know, a kind of a mercenary, Al Qaeda kind of mercenary. Maybe not technically Al Qaeda, but he's clearly not a good guy. And he's and and here, oh, you know, we've got McC McCain buddying up with them. Yeah, McCain says, you know, I had no idea who these guys were at the time that I met them. Yeah, well, you know, that's that's pretty bright, isn't it? I mean, what you, you know, <laughs> just just meets up with random people in the Middle East. <laughs> yeah, let's just fly over to the Middle East and take pictures with a bunch of Middle Eastern guys who don't know who they are. I mean, sure, come on, give me a break. Yeah, this is a this is obvious public relations type picture where McCain's got you know his buddy photo with a group of smiling Syrian guys with you know beards, look like young guys, and so here the idea is these guys can't be all that bad. Of course, you start looking at who they are, and they've been mercenaries all over. One of them is Mustafa, is even claiming to have access to the White House. What's he got access to the White House for? And then, um, you know, the other thing I've been researching through the day is that this um, FSA, the, uh, the this, uh, this this group of uh, Freedom Syrian, Free Syrian Army, is the group that the State Department, CIA, today are wanting to settle on. Is oh, well, these are really the <laughs> You know, yeah. these are really the good guys. Well, you know, then I found a Brookings Institute um, paper that goes back to March 2012. It was called Saving Syria. Of course, the whole article talks about how you destroy Syria, basically. You go in there and destroy the Assad regime. That's the whole. You know, so clearly, the Brookings Institute, and I'm also confident the Council on Foreign Relations, going back probably two, three, four years have been strategizing, maybe more, oh, yeah. how we destabilize Syria. And um, the options were all laid out. Uh, the option they seem to think is going to work the best is the uh, invading with troops. And then the uh, Brookings Institute somehow or other thinks that it will get paid for by the European Union and the Arab states. And Dr. Corsi, if I could interrupt you briefly, I just want to hit that point that you uh, laid out there, the ground troops. We saw a report recently, and even today I reported on, on the InfoWars Nightly News earlier, that they had 75,000, excuse me, 75,000 ground troops. You know, is the estimate they think is what is necessary to secure Syria. And they've been planning this for a while. I mean, they've been planning to go in sending ground troops to get rid of chemical weapons. And he drew that line exactly a year before the attack happened. Well, I think that's been the plan. See, what I'm coming up to the conclusion is that this has been a right. long time brewing Council on Foreign Relations and uh, Brookings Institute, other probably other think tanks in Washington, deciding how they can destabilize Syria and get rid of Assad. Mm -hmm. 
And it looks like that, you know, looking at all the options, they figured, well, we're going to have to send some ground troops in there. So we better have a pretext. The pretext, a real good one, might be chemical weapons. Right. Mm -hmm. They were just waiting for something so, to happen, regardless if it was provocateur or not. You know, just any excuse they can to go in and, you know, just seize the country. Is, that's what they're going to do. Well, a long time ago, Wesley Clark talked about the sequence of countries that they were going to go in, and this is following along that sequence. But their plans have gotten very specific. But their, their lies are about as transparent as emperor's clothes, right? I mean, nobody's buying this. Everybody is la The public here is laughing at it. Foreign governments are laughing at them. They're, between this and the NSA spying scandals, the American regime has basically become an international laughing stock, a pariah. Even McCain admitted that. He said, we have uh, yeah. barely any credibility left. <laughs> well, they don't have any credibility because they lie. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, hello. You know, come on, guys. They, what they are doing, is, what this Brookings Institute paper is, it's Brookings Institute memo number 21. Look it up. It's the called Saving Syria, Assessing Options for Regime Change. And it's written by four heavyweights in the Brookings Institute crowd on Iran, mostly Iran. And what these guys are talking about is they want to get Iran. To get Iran, they want to destabilize Syria. That's the whole point. And they're trying to find a, which method is going to work better. They decide they probably better invade with troops. And then the pretext is going to be Assad's a bad guy who uses chemical weapons. Now, if this cover story is created in 2012, or maybe before, and we're just playing it out today, this is obviously you know, making the facts fit a lie. Yeah. And, and we've seen not, several chemical attacks that we've already have already been determined by the UN as being yeah. chemical attacks carried out by rebels. And also uh, Russia did their uh, own uh, investigation of the earlier attack and they said you know, they have a 100 page report they submitted to the UN and that's the reason the UN went in in the first place. Well, I, you know, I read the report of the UN. In fact, I quoted it in WND extensively because the UN went over these charges were made by Obama in March and April of this year when he was mm -hmm. in Israel and he was been beating this drum for a while. So the UN sent a team in there and the team came back and they said no. The the rebels probably have been using chemical gas. And that would actually make sense. I mean, the rebels are losing, they're fighting, scrambling. The rebels would like to prove that Assad or like to make it seem like Assad was using Although it's kind of like a rebel false flag to feed the CIA with the information they want. So they have a pretext on the world scene to come in and attack uh, Assad. But Assad's sitting there and Assad's saying, wait a minute, why would I ever use chemical weapons? I don't need to use chemical weapons. I got an army. I got an air force. Exactly. I'm beating these guys. And besides, if you look at the areas that were hit and who the victims were, there were as many... Um, Assad loyalists killed in the population as anybody. These mm -hmm. were not attacks in the rebel strongholds. This so last the weekend, there was a MSNBC panel, and they had a former Bush administration person who is now at the university. Her name was, uh, she was a Ms. Mann Leverett. And she was very specific about what they found when they investigated back in May. They said the sarin gas was not industrially produced, nor were right. the delivery mechanisms industrially produced. They were homemade. So that's why they all identified that as being the rebels at that time. So certainly they have access to it. But of course, Kerry, well, I guess, realizing that this is going to unravel on him, said, well, we don't care who did it. It's just that they're there is why we have to go there. Right? Well, Kerry, you know, Kerry is a professional liar. So it yeah. doesn't really make any difference what Kerry says. He's right. been all over the board in so many positions. Even just, Putin said that about him recently. He is. It, it, it carries lack of credibility since I wrote an unfit for command on him and exposed him with John O'Neill. Mm -hmm. Look, Kerry is just a, a hack. It's about the best way you can put Harry. Kerry, you know, look at. Here's the issue. The issue is this: that uh, this chemical attack business, because the, the Assad government put out the films that we've all been showing about these, you know, caches of chemicals that were in the Syrian rebels' uh, strongholds with chemicals from Saudi Arabia. and looks like a you know a home chemistry set of mix up your own poison. Mm -hmm. That's not government issue. That's, that's the rebels. Well, if you go back, let's just go back for a minute. We had uh, Saddam Hussein using chemical weapons against the Kurds back in the 1980s. We had the, the war between uh, Iraq and Iran throughout the 1980s, what, how many, eight years, how many people do they kill between the two countries? They're using chemical weapons all the time. 
Mm-hmm. Was the United States or the United Nations in the middle because we were concerned that some red line had been crossed? I don't remember that. Exactly. And, and when you look at weapons of mass destruction, look at our history of weapons of mass destruction and use and how we had sarin gas up until it was banned in the 1990s. But we've also are still using depleted uranium, which has a tremendous long-term effect on the survivors in an area as well as on the soldiers who use it. And what really scares me in terms about weapons of mass destruction is what DARPA is working on in terms of these killer robots that they're now working on giving them some autonomous decision making. And that's a situation where you put those things in an area they could use regular uh, projectile weapons or they could use chemical weapons if they wanted to, but they could basically go in and kill every living, moving thing in an area that didn't have a defense department tag on it. Well, see, the, there's no doubt the chemical weapons are very frightening. Mm-hmm. But what I'm, my point is that um, the governments like the United States have learned how to use chemical weapons as a false flag mm-hmm. so that uh, rebels who are the ones who are utilizing the weapons, that's all the UN incredible information we've got, all the research I've done, I've, I've published pictures in WND of the rebels in Syria loading these blue kind of like almost homemade cans on top of some kind of a rocket launching device. And they show this on the major networks. Uh, just to interrupt you briefly, Dr. Corsi, they show this footage on the mainstream networks with the Al Qaeda logo on the videos, and they're saying, you know, this is the Assad regime. Yeah, I mean, a government launch of chemical weapons is going to look a lot more professional. Okay, it's not going to look like this ragtag. You know, let's mix it up in the basement with a chemistry set. Look like a couple of frat guys out there having a, a weekend. Yeah, and so. Suddenly, this is the information the CIA seizes on. They get some intercepts, probably intercepts, if we could hear these radio intercepts, are, you know, Syrian commanders saying, what's going on? You know, we didn't do this. Who did this? You know, and so well, we, now we've got the Syrian military talking about the gas attack. So, of course, the CIA, let's use that as evidence that proves they were responsible for it. And they actually contradicted themselves. They used some uh, Israeli intelligence saying about the episode you just mentioned. But then they came out and said, well, we saw them moving around and making plans and distributing gas masks three days prior. And so the question is where they didn't warn anybody. But if there was premeditated planning, on the part of the Syrian administration, then why would they be reacting in a surprised way? So even the White House's briefing paper is contradictory. And if you read this Brookings Institute report, I mean, I'm looking on page 14 of it, okay? It says, um, this is all a scenario in 2012. The United States will want to build within the Friends of Syria a smaller contact group, regardless of which approach is taken, um, uh, in, indeed, should Assad not fall, this group would also be vital for con- containing the spillover from a Syrian civil war. In addition, the United States will want to expand ties to Syria opposition and try to push them to be more cohesive. So, in other words, it looks like the Brookings Institute, the Council on Foreign Relations, probably even the CIA, two years ago almost or longer had identified this FSA as going to be the group that they were going to champion as the good guys among the rebels. Mm -hmm. Well, everything I've done with the FSA is finding out they're about as ragtag and as penetrated by mercenaries and al-Qaeda bad guys as anybody else. I can't find anybody on this Syrian opposition group that is a good guy. They all want a Sharia state. They all want Islamic control. They're opposing Assad because Assad is, is secular. And we're going to pick one of these guys and say these are the good guys. I mean, that, yeah. that cover story isn't going to fly. Meanwhile, we're funding these people. Well, of course we are, because it was the cover story. We passed resolutions, we're supposed to send them arms. You got uh, John McCain running over there and, you know, having buddy photos taken with the Syrian rebels, not realizing he's probably standing with two of the most mercenary in the whole group. But they speak English, so they're educated, and he's, you know, in English and he says, well, these have to be good guys. Well, I guess when I look at this, Dr. Corsi, the thing that's, that comes across to me is that this is the same sort of thing we've seen over and over again. We get involved in a conflict where there isn't a good guy, and we wind up selling arms to both sides. We wind up eventually going to war against both sides, uh, using up a lot of weapons, spending a lot of money. 
and a lot of people dying. And I think people are getting really tired of that. You know, on, on Friday night, CNN was talking about how Obama was war weary, but I think it's the American people that are war weary. You had an article talking about on, on WND saying that calls to Congress are running 499 to one against the Syrian war. Well, see, what, what's go, what I'm saying here is that you've got another false flag of, of, of pushing people to war. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's the Lusitania sinking or whether it's the Gulf of Tonkin, and we don't find out until years later that the Maddox was in the Gulf of Tonkin doing intelligence work, and there weren't any uh, fishing boats that were equipped with torpedoes that attacked them from North Vietnam. It was all a CIA lie. Yes, yes. Well, again, what we got here is that the CIA is cooking up another lie. Yeah. And this lie, which was originally hatched in the Brookings Institute, the Council on Foreign Relations, was, hey, why don't we accuse Assad of chemical weapons? Then we can go in and attack him and get rid of him. And the truth is, if you really read these documents that were written two years ago or more by the Council on Foreign Relations or the Brookings Institute, they knew then that airstrikes weren't going to do anything. The whole idea was, let's get airstrikes. You know, it was like a Cuban missile it was like Bay of Pig, where the CIA tried to bamboozle John, Car John, John Kennedy and say, oh, well, these, you know, these um, rebels from, you know, the, the self-trained rebels who we were training in Nicaragua are going to go back in. You know, they're going to capture Cuba, the Bay of Pigs. It's going to be fine. We send in a few B-26s. And the, and the CIA knew from the beginning that wouldn't work, and they were trying to corner Kennedy where he would launch strikes off an aircraft carrier. Exactly. Now, Dr. Corsi, our, our time is winding down. Uh, is go ahead and finish flag, your thought, please. Yes. The false flag lie concocted as a cover story in order to bamboozle the American people into yet another pointless, stupid war. And they've so, been doing that successfully for so long. This time it didn't work. And that's what I think is the real story here is that this time, and I think that's what surprised them. They have seen this same trick work over and over and over again. On. Don't you think we're catching on after 50, you know, this is... A, Why do you just, think people are catching on? It's because of the alternative media, don't you think? Well, it is. I think mm -hmm. since the, it's been since the sinking of the Maine, you know, these bull... I'm sorry, these nonsense cover stories that we get concocted here by intelligence agencies trying to bamboozle people into being whipped up over war, uh, I think are, are, the Internet's putting an end to because there's too many of us out there who can say, wait a minute, I'm going to go find the Brookings Institute, what they were saying about this... 2012, I find Brookings Institute, they're exactly. talking about the plan that John Kerry is running out in front of the House and Senate this week. Well, and even with all the lies there, they have, you know, just Obama the other day said, you know, I didn't set this red line, the world set this red line. Then, oh, yeah. then we have the table, everybody, everybody has the table, but it wasn't that long ago he actually said this. In the final analysis, it doesn't make any difference. Bush, Obama, they're the same thing. Yes. This is the Democrats or Republicans, there's no difference anymore. This is all... The bankers, this is all the... But don't you see that there's a, perhaps a realignment going on in terms of libertarians versus authoritarians? I mean, certainly we see the leadership of Boehner and Pelosi. Like you said, the Democrats, it doesn't matter whether they're Democrats or Republicans. The leadership is firmly in the camp. The leadership, the leadership has uh, gone so far off the deep end of being rewarded in Washington that to, and being rewarded for selling these lies that I think the rank and file of both parties have said enough. And the, the group within the Democrats who you know, have always been predisposed towards peace and not wanting war have joined with the constitutionalists on the right. And those of us who are saying, you know, again, there's, these wars are pointless. We're being bamboozled into them. It's a lie. And so a new alignment's occurring. And I think where people are just basically tired of big government lies. And That's exactly, exactly what it is. Now, I'm afraid, Dr. Corsi, we have come to the end of our broadcast. So I just want to get right. the final thoughts uh, from you, David, and then from Dr. Corsi. Well, I guess I, I'm, I'm wondering, and I'll ask you, uh, Dr. Corsi, what do you think will happen? The public is overwhelmingly against this. What if Congress gets bought up and they don't, and they vote uh, for this? And then what if they don't? What if they follow the public and then Obama goes ahead and ignores the, the Congress and goes ahead and strikes. What do you think of uh, those two well, scenarios? First, let's deal with the first one. I think mm -hmm. the, the best line of defense we have right now is the House of Representatives because they're all up for you know, re-election within pretty close to a year now. And, mm -hmm. and I think there's enough anger in the American people. Let's just fire them all. 
And when they get the idea they're going to lose, I don't think they want to go into election trying to explain why they got bamboozled into another Tonkin Gulf lie. Uh, secondly, if Obama decides to go ahead without Congress, then I think there's going to be a movement to say, yeah, we're tired of all this. Let's impeach him because this reopens the issue. If, you know, the CIA is lying to us about chemical attacks in Syria, the NSA is lying to us about the surveillance of civilians, yes, it, yes. it may just be time to shut down this whole government. Mm -hmm. What do we need them for? If they're going to lie to us and, you know, rush us into the situations that are on the edge of World War III or on the edge of some totalitarian state that nobody wants to live in. Let's just Let's just say... You know, shut it down. And it's the and same it's ones, the same ones, excuse me, the same ones that are going for the unconstitutional spying, the TSA, mm -hmm. the indefinite detention without trial. They're also the ones who are pushing for war. It's that authoritarian wing that everybody is so disgusted with. Well, it's the way to keep power mm -hmm. and people in fear. Yes. And I think finally people are saying, look, stop lying to us. Stop lying to us. You've got the IRS, you know, going after Tea Party groups you lied mm -hmm. about. You got the exactly. NSA, uh, it, you know, really looking at re reporters, the employees of the NSA are looking at their boyfriends and girlfriends and husbands and wives. Yeah. <laughs> They're spying on everybody. Everybody, right. yeah. Yet, yeah. Quit lying to it. We need this big facility built out in the West with all these buildings to store all this information. Yeah, all these slow Yoda bites that they get have. Yes. Out there. We need to fund that. Let's reduce the deficit somewhat. Let's. Blow that thing up and call a missile strike in on the Utah Daily yeah, Center. Hit, hit it with a drone or two. <laughs> well, Dr. Corsi, Dave Knight, I definitely appreciate your time. I, I hate to cut you short there, Doctor. I know you, you have many more things, but hopefully we can get you back on the show also on the Alex Jones radio show. Anytime. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. And I hated to cut Dr. Corsi short there, but, you know, he has some great things to say, but we had a schedule to keep. So hopefully we can get him back on the Alex Jones Day Show and also right here on the InfoWars Nightly News. I'd also like to thank you, David, for sitting in with us. Uh, always has those, those great points. So stay tuned because right after this, we're going to have a special interview. Uh, this is uh, something we went out in the streets to do. You know, there's a couple who came in. They're a local couple who live a little bit outside the city of Austin. They have a complete solar complex, very self-contained. Not just solar, they have aquaponics and so those things uh, out there as well. And if you're in the city of Austin or outside the city of Austin, I definitely suggest you guys go out there and check it out. It's a great complex, and we'll show you that right after this. But first, if you like this broadcast and you want to see it continue, stop by prisonplanet.tv and get yourself a 15-day free trial. Like I said, it's all there. The Alex Jones Show, the nightly news, the rants, the special reports, and so much more. So stay tuned for that interview right after this. Introducing Pro One. All of your filtration in one system, portable, on the go. No more do you have two or three filters to just reduce sodium fluoride. You have a system that cuts out the sodium fluoride and up to 95% of hydrofluorosilicic acid. Advanced manufacturing technology combines silver impregnated white ceramic with new Aquamedics advanced media for removal of fluoride and other heavy metals, all in one filter element. It is the only one that does it and out of the gates. We have it discounted at 10% off with promo code WATER. This is the only system that in one unit helps reduce or remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, ammonia, and chlorine, hydrofluorosilicic acid, the most common form of fluoride not covered by other fluoride filter brands, and sodium hexafluorosilicate. Get your Pro Pure with a new Pro One filter today at InfoWarsStore.com or by calling 888-253-3139. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. The terms preparedness, self-sustainability, and sovereign living are terms that we use a lot here on the InfoWars Nightly News. But how do you get to those points? How do you actually get to where you're off the grid, living within your means, but also not tied to the grid? How, do you, how, do, how does that happen? Well, we've got two guests here that are going to answer some of those questions. They are from the Industrial Country Market here in Central Texas, a family-owned and operated retail, educational, and garden center um, Uniquely sustained by the sun, wind, and rains, 100% off-grid. And the owners here are Dan and Michelle Brech. We welcome them to the show. How are you guys doing today? Fine, thank you. So, 
first question everybody has when they go try to go off grid is, you know, how much does it cost and where do I start? Well, what you would start with is you, you would try to make the assessment of what you're trying to do, all right? Uh, when you're grid tie, plug anything in, do anything you want, no big deal. When you're off grid, you have to make an assessment of where you want to be and go from there and start. What does it generally cost? It's hard to say because some person needs $1,000 a month for electricity, some person needs $100 a month for electricity. So what we generally start with is conservation of what you're trying to do. It's the first thing. Once we get there, most systems today, can. the, the price of solar panels have come down tremendously in the past five years. They came down from a, a solar panel costing $1,400 a panel down to about $200 a panel. And so if you needed 10 or 20 panels, you've come down from 25,000 down to 4,000. Big so difference. It's big difference in cost. So therefore, the, the payback on that, if you're just looking at simple, simple numbers, you can get it down depending on how you do it anywhere between five to seven to 10 years, depending on how you present it. A, a typical well-designed small house, we have a typical well-designed ho small house on our, on, our, on our property. We have a 1,400 square foot house that's air conditioned, this is Texas, and it, it, we keep the temperature year round very comfortable, like in the summertime, we'll keep it about 69, 70 degrees. That's very comfortable. It's very comfortable, and an entire system with a house that's made out of SIPs, which are structural insulated panels, mm -hmm. the entire electrical system would cost about $18,000 from a company out of Florida. So uh, that would, and that would include the panels, the batteries, the wires, the controllers, the inverters, everything. So you'd be your own power system. Which I think is the problem with solar today. Um, you know, when the government invests in solar, they invest in these giant companies who are trying to make farms and then sell power to people. Instead of getting on the philosophy, hey, we need to get individuals powered in communities, and then any of that excess power could go within the community. But instead of trying to, the old model, which is we have giant power plants that manufacture power and then send it out over you know, giant. That's correct. Uh, it, it, the reality, it's all run by money, yeah. to be honest. And, and if you, uh, th the thing today is that it can be done successfully by individuals, but it's not for everybody, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you need to do a bunch of uh, investigation of where you're trying to go with it before you get involved. Uh, the viewpoint point about uh, everybody being in solar, is, it, I, that's not really true. There's certain, we give classes in it, and we try to clarify for people so that they can understand whether it makes sense for them, either financially or where they want to go or where it doesn't. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem out there in the community, as far as I'm concerned, is the lack of real education behind the solar. Does it make sense for me or does it not? That's well, there's so many different yeah. variables. How do you want to live? How do you live? Do you have to have all of the amenities, yes, and you can do it. I keep that house at 69 degrees because that's where I want to live. Right. You know, so it depends on how you how you live and what you want to do. But if it goes down, you don't get on the phone and right. call. You have to get out and fix it yourself. Exactly. And those are the kinds of things you need to realize. Now, you wouldn't put it in and move the next year. Right. So. Is it a piece of land that you want to keep? It's an investment, essentially. Exactly. Well, uh, let's go other, I guess the other things you guys talk about, also water collection. That is a lot easier to get into. I do it at my house for my gardens. I, I actually have Well, we got, we got into water collection because the, we, the house that we first went to, we just, we we're from Houston and, and we called the well guy and he wanted like $6,000 and we thought, we're not gonna be here that often. Do I wanna put six or $7,000 in a well? And I remember reading Mother Earth News about collecting rainwater. So he sold us a rain tank for about a, what, about $1,000 for the rain tank. Back in 95, though. Back, mm -hmm. Well, but they're not that much more yeah. right now. And so we collected it off the roof. Well, and, and because we were there periodically, it turned out to be real nice. But then you started to realize the benefits of rainwater. No dissolved rock, no mm -hmm. dissolved salts, no minerals, all of a sudden, all the equipment, meaning your water heater, your toilets, your toilets, mm -hmm. doesn't turn orange. All of a sudden, oh gosh, this is just wonderful. The flappers don't need to be replaced. That's, oh, that's exactly. right. Exactly, it doesn't have that. And then, and so when we first started collecting rainwater, it was just out of financial necessity. 
And then when we opened this new facility out here, it made logical sense. So we, we will hold about 40,000 gallons of rainwater out there. What got you guys in, uh, into this? Why, why, did, why did you decide to go into this route of sustainable living, getting off the grid? Well, that's because we were school teachers. Mm -hmm. We got our education in school. To, we, we both Well, back in the 70s. Back in the we 70s, we both taught terrible. school. And then we got into business. And we didn't take business 101. Big mistake, mm -hmm. okay? Because... We've been renting our business in Houston since 1985. I've paid $1.5 million in rent with no equity. Right. I've paid for the electric company $450,000. Now, I'm not mad. Yeah. I'm not bad. I just wasn't educated. Right. So 10 years ago, when I was 55, we, we sat down and said, this is stupid. Everything's fine, except that we have no backup. So that was, we, we like the business. We like retail. We, we like, like people. We mm -hmm. like people. We like dealing with people. So we, we found this piece of property right out on 71, which is halfway between Houston and Austin, mm -hmm. and decided, hey, let's put this store up and carry unique things in the store. We have 6,000 square foot of unique, we call it stuff. Uh, much of it can never be bought again. We buy it from jobbers. We buy okay. things from ends of lots, ends of seasons, that kind of thing. So I have over 15,000 SKUs in the store, mm -hmm. but not deep. Right. Not one, or two, one or two items, that's A it. case. Yeah, a case. Yeah, a okay. box. And so the idea was this would be our retirement. We could do that, and mm -hmm. then we could also make it all solar, because mm -hmm. uh, we already know that works. From our camp From our camp house. And I thought, well, gosh, we could show people that this does work. Right. And, you know, collecting the rainwater and then... My son does art, so we put up a, an art building. It's three thousand square foot building that that we leave, let people bring their items in and sell them on consignment there. Okay. And then uh, we, we, we're we're growing food hydroponically. We're getting ready to do aquaponics. It saves water. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're we're learning all this uh, the John Dewey way. Yeah. And that's it. And and the key is you. you it didn't happen overnight. It's a process. It's not gonna. You're not just gonna snap your fingers and be off the grid. It does take a lot of work, and people it does. need to understand. It takes that. planning, and right. we're not. We're right. We're not done right now. We're putting up another greenhouse mm -hmm. right now. That, that we're gonna change it. Probably sell some things off that we don't want at the beginning, and then then uh, we actually bought a, a greenhouse from St. Edwards University here. It was on auction, and we mm -hmm. took it down, and we're gonna put it up out at our place. Right. It's a process. It is a process. It's a process. Every uh, a friend was walking with me last month, and she's walking around. She goes, "I see a lot of ADD here." I said, <laughs> "Yeah, we do start and stop things, but right. we'll get it finished. We'll get it figured out." Exactly. I've actually driven by this facility several times out on Highway 71 uh, in Columbus, in between Houston and Austin, and we actually sent a crew there recently to get a full-scale tour and see what it's all about and what it takes to get off the grid. Shakari Jackson files this report. Welcome to Industrial Country Market. My name is Michelle Brech. This is my husband, Daniel Brech. We've been working on this endeavor since 2005. This is our non-general general store in the middle of Texas, 100% off the grid. It's a SIPS house, structurally insulated panels. The walls, the outside walls are six inches thick. The ceiling is eight inches thick. If somebody would have told me I was going to spend the rest of my life in a 1,400 square foot house, I would have said, oh, I don't think so. But because the ceilings are high, it feels good. We've lived in the house. Our first day we lived in the house was January 1. We don't have it finished. We don't have the, the um, woodwork done. This is our guest bedroom. It has trundle beds so we can sleep four people. And that's what we have as far as two boys, their wives, and kids. So that's how this goes. Not a big room, but it feels bigger because of the ceiling. This is our bathroom. My husband's favorite place is this bathroom. All of the tile came from Habitat for Humanity out of Houston, except for the picture tile. The picture tile we sell. That's an artist out of China by the name of Ping. And so that's a really good shower. We are 100% off the grid. We make all of our own power from the solar panels, panels that are out front. And so you can live comfortably 100% off the grid. That's why we think this is so valuable for people to see. Is there anything that we're missing? People come in and go, oh my gosh, you don't have a dishwasher. 
I didn't want a dishwasher. Could we have plumbed for it? Of course. But two people, what a waste. We have a condo in Houston. We hardly ever use the dishwasher. So no, it's, it's very doable. You just got to plan. What happens is that there's solar panels out on the front and they're all routed through these cables, these gray cables here on the ground. They come up here to these charge controllers. And the charge controllers themselves are the devices that assure that the batteries don't get overcharged. So when, they, when the sun comes out and they, get, they fill it up at the, the most efficient way. So it goes through the charge controllers and it comes into the batteries. And then the batteries store the electrical energy. We collect rainwater. The roof up here is what's called a shed roof which means it's only on one plane. And back here it goes to these gutters. And the gutter itself goes to one black pipe down there and it goes to that tank that's on that tower. So then it goes to those black tanks and then by gravity it just fills it up under pressure. And then those white pipes down there, we put the, the water from these tanks in the ground, comes down through here and up into this system here. And this is our filter. This is the first filter that we get to. And this filter is a gross filter. And then it goes to this carbon filter. And then the water is pretty darn clean by the time it gets out of here and it's pressurized by this pump. And this is hydroponics. Um, hydroponics, of course, is growing your plants in water, adding food to the tanks uh, of water for the plants to grow. I've been doing this now for five years. Uh, I've learned by doing. I um, did my research online and my research by experimenting. And this is the process of five years of me experimenting. So uh, we're having fun. We do consignments here for anybody, any artist, uh, somebody who'd like to sell their artwork, uh, a piece of furniture or benches that they make. We have fair trade items. We know where it all comes from. Um, anything from Vietnam, India, East Indian, uh, Thailand, USA made lotions with the naked bee, and I, we have friends in Colorado that make the soap, little wares from around the world. We have a non-general general, general store. We're off the electrical grid. We have a variety of items on the inside. We also have classes. We have classes on solar. The class on solar is to empower you to make the right decision behind solar. Typically, it's on a Saturday from 10 to about 1 or 2. We have a class on hydroponics. It's usually on a Sunday. ICM71.com is our website. Thank you. And that was a quick look at the industrial country market out on Highway 71 in Central Texas near Columbus. And their website is ICM71.com. You guys have quite a facility out there. And uh, you teach classes. What, what classes do you offer? We offer one class on Solar 101. Dan teaches it. We wrote the curriculum to be for Texas. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, it, it's designed around this latitude mm -hmm. so that people have the right things to run their uh, equipment on. Our, the biggest deal is air conditioning, obviously. Okay, And can it run? The answer is yes. We run uh, very, very efficient air conditioners that you can get off of eBay. Very cost effective. Uh, they're called mini splits. Their oh, yeah. their uh, air conditioners work fine, and we're off the grid, and we run them on batteries at night. It works very effectively. Uh, the other classes, uh, my my nephew gives a class on hydroponics. We've had people give classes on on beekeeping, and we have had other people give classes on uh, plants. Uh, and, and we're we're trying to encourage more the 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 classes that way. Mm -hmm. So I have another other instructors come in. Other people things. come in, yes. Because you guys are more of a hub. Than... We're, well, we ha we'd, we like to be a destination where people mm -hmm. could come through. They could come and have. We've had people had lunches there. They have. Uh, we've got picnic tables set up, and they can sit down and eat and view the water gardens. And we show people how you can collect rainwater. Uh, we talk about that, but that's it's not really a, a, a very difficult class. So we, 15 minutes, we get you right up on what's Stall going. a gutter, put in a container. <laughs> there you got there you it. Go. It's all I did it myself, and I didn't even go to a class. And <laughs> right, and, and we just, we just things that are simple like that. Yeah. We're learning things all the time. That's from correct. People. That's, That's what we like. And bottom line, what you've learned in buying solar panels, what do you look for in the, the two big things? What I look for, the first thing, it's actually the dollar per watt, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and and that's, that's the key runner. I mean, people ask me, what manufacturer? Well, 
I'm not, I'm not too keen on them. The manufacturers go in and out of business all the time. But if you buy the dollar per watt, but the other tie into that is it has to have at least a 20-year warranty or 25-year warranty. And what that means, a typical warranty doesn't mean at 25 years the panel's bad. A typical warranty means that after 20, 20 or 25 years, it's only down 10 or 15 percent, which means a 100-watt panel is only down to 90 or 85 watts, which means it's still perfectly usable. Still generating plenty of electricity. Plenty of electricity and, and put 15% more on, and then you're back to where you were from previous 20 years. One last question, batteries. What should people look for in batteries? If they're batteries, the, the, the most difficult thing is the batteries. They're very heavy. Mm -hmm. um, they're corrosive. And if you're going to be off the grid a long time, you're looking for long-term batteries. Uh, there's companies called Rolls that, that develop batteries. Uh, Trojan makes batteries. And probably the recommendation is going to be a forklift battery. And the reason you'd want to use a forklift battery is because it would last you an incredible long period of time. The biggest disadvantage of a forklift battery is they weigh three or 4,000 pounds. So once you put it down, you better be in the right place. So it doesn't go on the back of the forklift. The forklift actually has to lift it. <laughs> yeah, if the okay. forklift would put the battery where you need it on an off-grade situation. Gotcha. Okay. Well, very interesting. Uh, love seeing the tour of the place. I'm going to stop by with the family uh, definitely at some point in the future and check it out. It was great having hey, you in here. Thank you very much. I appreciate right. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. And that was Dan and Michelle Brett from the Industrial Country Market. You can find out more about what they do and how to get into solar yourself at ICM71.com. And uh, let me just tell you this. You know, we were talking off... Uh, in between here and in between takes uh, about, you know, what do you do when the grid goes down? Well, they don't have to worry about it because they've already installed their own grid. But we do offer a preparedness readiness book special, when disaster strikes, when technology fails, and strategic relocation. It's all for under $100. Those are some great books, two of them by Matthew Stein, one of them by Joel Skousen. We also have a companion video for strategic relocation, which is an interview Alex did with Joel Skousen here in the studio. A lot of information there to get yourself in that mindset of what do you do when technology and the government is not there to care for you and hold your hand all the way through. And with that, that's our show, the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. We'll see you next time, 7 p.m. Central. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at InfoWars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at InfoWars.com slash show.